Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Teacher's Point of View. We've got an extraordinary man here, Aidan Severs, who's uh, going to share us share with us a little bit of his experience and kind of the kind of where he feels education is and, and the direction it needs to move in. Um, Aidan, could you just kind of introduce yourself and kind of the journey you've been on in education, please? Yep. So my name's Aidan Severs. As you've said, I am a deputy head in the primary phase of an all through uh, academy in Bradford. We have uh, children from uh, nursery age right up to sixth form. And I lead the upper key stage two phase at the moment and have been um, doing some development work with key stage three as well. So the fact that we're an all through school gives an opportunity for that sort of work. Um, I've been a teacher for maybe about 13, 14 years. I've worked in four different schools in the Bradford area and um, slightly different schools. And so I've had a, a range of experiences uh, ranging from the sort of very as inner city Bradford as you can get uh, to the leafier suburbs, not the not the proper leafy ones, but leafier where you've got a, a, a much bigger sort of range of uh, economic backgrounds and things like that. Um, yeah, I have taught in mostly key stage two um although i did some did do my training in key stage one so i've got a bit of experience across the primary range um particular things that i've led on i've led on curriculum uh, as a whole particularly when the the current national curriculum uh, came out i led on uh, introducing that at the schools at the time Reading uh, has been another focus of, of what I've led on. Maths I led on in my previous school and um, b before all that I led on art which is actually what my uh, degree is in. So I, have a, I did a four-year course at what was St Martin's College in Lancaster which was mainly teaching, but it also meant that I came out with an art degree. So have an interest in a, a variety of subjects, really. Uh, and currently um, kind of oversee the curriculum and teaching and learning in my school, uh, which has meant that I've had quite a lot of, I've done quite a lot of development work on geography and history, actually, at my current place. So I've had a, a nice... Uh, range of experiences in terms of um, leading on different areas of the curriculum which is the thing I love really curriculum teaching and learning I don't like to get too bogged down in lots of the other stuff that you have to do as school leaders uh, those are my my bread and butter really yeah, I mean, what an, what an amazing journey. I mean, you, you've obviously done pretty much everything barring RE and music from, from what I listen to. Um, no, I mean, you, you've had quite a, quite a journey. I mean, curriculum is is a massive topic in itself, isn't it? I mean, just before we go on yeah. to that, you've, you've had quite a crazy year in the last 12 months, in particular from September, haven't you, with, with COVID cases? And yeah. I mean, could you just walk us through what you were telling me before we start recording? Well, yeah, I mean, we... So, as I mentioned, we're in Bradford. And if you look at um, Bradford in comparison with most other areas in the UK, we have actually only had one month out of lockdown, which was June. We had 30 days when we weren't in sort of restrict, you know, the, the wider restrictions. There were still restrictions. But, yeah, we, we have spent the majority of the last year being fairly tightly um, kept at home, I suppose, really. Um, so we, and, and the reason for that is because we, we did have high numbers of cases in the city. And um, I mean, I don't want to get too political. <laughs> we, we didn't see those high numbers of cases, you know, when it all first hit, when it was more the South that was, um, showing those high numbers of cases, but we were still in lockdown then, obviously, as the whole country was. So we, yeah, we are in a, an area which has been fairly um, rife with cases. 
Um, and so, yeah, since September, we have had fairly regular bubble closures, as um, we're, we're calling them, as I think everyone is really, uh, where we've had, you know, one or two year groups out of school at a time. Um, yeah, I was just saying we closed another bubble today. Last week we closed one, the week before we closed one. Uh, we've got two bubbles due back tomorrow. It's quite a logistical thing to keep keep track of who's in, who's out and so on. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll invite those ones back in. We'll close no more. Half term will be one of those circuit breakers that we speak of and then uh, well, we'll see what happens on the 8th of March, won't we? <laughs> I mean, what a logistical nightmare by the sounds of it. I mean, did you say you've got four bubbles that are currently closed in, in your school? Yeah, four, so four year groups are currently out, um, only overlapping by one day, I think. Um, we, yeah, so three year groups should be back tomorrow. So Logistical nightmare. I mean, obviously your big focus is curriculum, right? And so you've got your, your work cut ahead of you in some respects because you, uh, it effectively it falls on you to kind of get these kids caught up, right? I mean, where, where, where do you stand with that? Yeah, it's, it's a funny one. And there's, there's a lot being said about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We... When, when we got back after summer, and obviously most children having not been in school, the key workers were, and I think year six reception and year one had come back before the summer. Yeah, we, we were actually pleasantly surprised. And I know that, you know, there's been some reports come out about how um, maths and English children are... Um, uh, behind on they're missing out on and things and I think that is the case but I think we definitely saw some positives um, and we 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 definitely saw the fact that because our remote learning had focused on rather than teaching new content we used that opportunity to go over previous content we actually felt that a lot of the children came back with a really strong foundation to to build on and we feel like we were able to do quite a lot in the the autumn term to to make quite rapid gains with the children and and they had a good foundation for that obviously they you know we, we're now in another period of lost learning although i think in general remote learning has improved vastly in this half term but potentially because of that, um, the law which came in in October, which said, you know, you have to provide it. It has to do X, Y and Z. Um, and potentially because I think, you know, as a profession, we realise, you know, we're, we're in this for the long term now. We need to do something that really works. I think in the the previous academic year, we were always kind of hoping for, it to just be for for two more weeks and then we'd be back but I think we've learned from that that you know it's it's not as simple as that so actually we've got to do something that really works and you know whether you're a fan of your live lessons or whether you're a fan of your pre-recorded video content or whether it's through work packs or you know textbooks sent home or whether it's through phone calls or online chats or whatever it is you're doing. I think, um, yeah, everyone has upped their game quite a lot with remote learning. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that the majority of children, the ones who've been accessing it, will potentially not see too many harmful effects on their learning. I mean, it does remain to be seen, doesn't it? The, you know, the data's not in on that yet. But I am encouraged by what we've been able to provide and what what seems to be the national picture on what's being provided. Um, certainly, I think there's there's quite a lot of positivity from parents on the whole, even though the media might paint that slightly differently. I think. Um, or Gavin Williamson. Well, yeah, I didn't want to <laughs> mention his name really, but yeah, the I think. I think those sorts of voices are, are in the minority, really, and that, that there has been a massively improved parent 
school relationship, homeschool relationship, where um, we're all working together to try and do what's best for these children. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like ultimately that's in some respects as a senior leader, you're you're responsible for like a thousand or like kids, if not more, if not slightly less, right? So that's a lot of children's futures that are, you're kind of accountable for, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. like. Uh, obviously there is going to be the lost learning regardless of of how good remote is i mean it's not the same as a teacher being there teaching you building that rapport with you you know and and those relationships i mean like so in terms of obviously when we do go back when when covid finally starts like kind of coming down if it does right i mean what what are we going to be going back to in terms of education are we going back to an education system that was prior to covid or are we going to be looking at an education that's completely different I think it's I think it will have changed. Whether that is in big noticeable ways or not does remain to be seen. I think there are definitely positives from this. I think, you know, talking about that homeschool relationship, I think over the last year we've got to know our families a lot more. You know, we've been placing weekly phone calls to every child, um, speaking to parents on a much more regular basis than we ever were. Um, you know, having those conversations about the learning and about what the, the each individual child needs. Um, and I can only see that as a positive because parental engagement is typically one of those tough nuts to crack for, for many schools. And I think we've kind of been forced into a situation where parental engagement is crucial. You know, they're doing, you know, a, a large proportion of parents are the ones who are actually having to do uh, part of the the curriculum teaching. So I think I think we will definitely reap the benefits from that. Whether or not we'll stick to remote parents' evenings and things like that, I'm not sure. Um, I definitely think there's a there's a there's positives and negatives. I think people have been able to run their parents' evenings a lot more smoothly. Uh, from their sofas at home um, or from their empty classrooms but I don't think we can underrate the you know the benefits of being face to face rather than looking at a screen like we're doing now I think we've we've done remarkably well to move our lives online whether that's your Sunday night quiz with your family or your um, your, your PPA session with your colleagues or whatever it is but um I think we'll all be quite relieved to get back to some more um, physical right. person-to-person interaction, won't we? Um, I think, you know, the the what what has been created during this time is this huge bank of resources that can be used remotely. You know, the the number of CPD opportunities that there are now because people have, you know, taken their time to produce online versions of what they normally uh, do as they travel around the country or whatever. We've got all those to tap into. Um, Schools who have been creating uh, video content, we've got all that to tap into now, Um, even just down to the, the fact that maybe you've done a, a maths video about how to do a certain calculation. Now, if a child stuck on that iPad, school website, video, and, you know, that free is only going to be um, positives to the, the newfound use of technology. However, I think what we have seen is the fact that technology definitely doesn't solve all the problems um you know there's there are there are people out there who are evangelists for for educational technology and i'm I'm not knocking them at all but i think what we've seen is that there needs to be that balanced approach there needs to be that real life contact as well as the 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 technological side of things um 
it's interesting though, isn't it? Because it's like gone from one side of the spectrum to the other, hasn't it? It's been all yeah. like non-technology to all technology, right? I mean, it, yeah. I, I think yeah. I think the positives are though that we have incorporated technology into education, right? And I don't yeah. think we should go back to kind of education without technology completely, because I think that the, the world is changing, and sometimes yeah. I feel like education is is working at 100 miles per hour and improving at 100 miles per hour whereas the 21st century is moving yeah. at a million miles per hour you know i still feel like education isn't quite getting up to where we need to be in the 21st century i mean do, yeah. do where do you think education is as a whole i mean do you think it's fit for purpose in terms of the way it currently runs not necessarily remotely but i mean like in terms of the curriculum in terms of like yeah. what we're teaching children i mean is there more we can do it's yeah again uh, Huge question, very interesting one, one that is debated widely, particularly in 280 characters on Twitter. <laughs> um, I, I, I would not say I'm a traditionalist. I wouldn't say I'm progressive. I would like to think that I'm fairly centrist in my views, which is why going back to the technology thing, I would say, yeah, we need to find a happy middle ground between all or nothing. Um, in terms of where education's at, I think I think the system gets a bad rap because I think you know there's that that view that it isn't fit for purpose and it's built on you know Victorian ways of yeah building a society. I still think it's a great idea to have children together in a school building. I think it's a great idea to have people who are trained as teachers to be the expert in the room. I think it's a great, um, a great thing to have a curriculum which is ambitious and which seeks to, um, which which seeks to teach children a certain set of things which are perceived to be um, useful and even exciting to know whether or not the current curriculum contains that is another question i think we do have an issue with um the national curriculum as it stands in terms of its um progression from primary through to secondary i think it is disjointed and i think even its creators have come out and said you know we didn't really join all the dots when we did it so I think there are opportunities there with the curriculum to reevaluate slightly. Um, I think what we need to do is to get a balanced approach to what we do. Um, the the trend has been as to to swing towards this knowledge rich curriculum, which I am. Um, I would say I'm a proponent of, but I don't think it's everything. I was chatting um, the other day to uh, someone who was involved in um, transition to Key Stage 3 in another trust in our area about transition. We are talking about how primary children come up with a certain set of knowledge, but from another primary school, they might have a slightly different knowledge base. And so how do you tackle that in year seven when you've got some children who know one thing and others who know another? And I think if all your curriculum does is seeks to teach particular facts, then you do have a problem at year seven when some children know one thing and some know another. But if your curriculum does more than that, if your curriculum seeks to um, put those facts into some sort of context that is relevant, then it doesn't matter so much if a child already knows that fact because it's then the case of, well, what are they going to do with that fact? How does that impact on them? How does that change their life? How does that link to other pieces of knowledge that they know? Uh, how does it link to um, skills that they can exhibit? So I think, yeah, I think, <laughs> and we'll pr probably, as, as the future happens, We'll probably just swing between the two, always trying to find the middle ground, I think. Um, yeah, I, I I think what the pandemic has done, you know, with regards to technology is it's shown us that 
technology can be a solution to problems. However, I think before, you know, there's, I see things like this on Twitter. Oh, we've just bought a class of iPads. What a class set of iPads, what apps should we put on it? And I think you should have known that before you were <laughs> spending all that money on iPads, because yeah. surely you should spend money because it's a solution to a problem. It's something that needs improving. And I think before there might have just been that, oh, let's get some tech because that's the new trendy thing. What should we do with it now? And then as with many things, it can end up languishing in a cupboard, gathering dust, um, not having a real purpose. So I think, yeah, the pandemic has shown us that technology does have its uses and it can be used to solve very real problems. And I hope that we'll... Um, take that forward i think as well what we've had to do is strip back our approach and have we've had to really think about what really matters um getting back to the basics simplifying how we teach and what we teach i think as with anything as time goes by it accumulates stuff things that you don't really need to do, but has kind of become trendy to do, or has kind of become um, just the expected thing to do. And I think education will constantly need to shake itself of those things um, and always come back to, well, what is our real core purpose? What are we trying to achieve? And what do we need to do to really achieve that? So I hope yeah, I, I hope more than anything, it changes the way that we think and evaluate what we do instead of just doing everything because it's what we've always done. I mean, the, we start to think about what's really necessary. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good point because I do sometimes feel when I'm speaking to certain senior leaders, they're doing things because they have to tick certain boxes. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's not, it's not, I mean, they don't always come across in that way, but <clears throat> I remember I was reading through a curriculum that a current school has. It's an, it's, it's, it's a secondary school and it's got, <clears throat> it's, it's one of the top performers in the country mm. and their whole curriculum was very much based on memorizing information. So like yeah. well, teaching kids had to memorize information so they can pass exams better. I mean, that was literally a three page document based around yeah. that. Right. And, Actually, what about like teaching children how to be good people, show love, show empathy, show charisma, show passion, yeah. collaboration, yeah. presentation, like those real life skills that you don't just get from learning content. I mean, content should yeah. be the starting point. The knowledge should be the starting point. Right. Yeah. And then it should be about how to apply that knowledge and how to what, what can you do with it. Right. And I, th yeah. I think you, you talk about kind of primary school children being at different places when they go into year seven actually like the content is irrelevant in some respects it's actually what like it's, it's about kind of um, creating curiosity in learning and actually helping a kid want to learn right and I think Definitely. that is what the fundamental issue that is missing in certain primary schools and, and children when they're going into secondary schools yeah or, or do you think that's wrong no I think well uh, I think it, uh, like you say it would differ depending on the school that they've been in and what that what the emphasis has been yes I think that primary school and secondary school is a is a place where you develop as a human being you you learn all those skills like you were just talking about you you find out who you are what your place is in the world how you fit in how you relate to others um things like skills like empathy and so on very hard to pin down very difficult to put in the curriculum more easy to think about in terms of the school's values and the school's ethos and a, and a sort of a whole way of working. You know, you can deliver content in a way which does develop empathy, for example, or you can just deliver content. And I think where there are opportunities to really develop the whole child, then those should be taken. Um, which you I know. sometimes feel it's not though, right? I mean, I, I genuinely feel sometimes it's not. Yeah. It's very content driven. And I feel like sometimes we, we teach the things that are easily measurable, but actually it's the things that are difficult to measure that we, we just stay away from it because it's like, how do we assess whether we're making progress or not? And actually there's, there's more to life than just data, right? Well, I th and yeah, I think, I think that's right. And I think because schools do have to 
take in data on academic progress. That is what becomes the focus quite often. Um, and as I've said, you know, I, I really think it's important to teach children facts, but I don't think that is everything. I think... I think if that is the approach and if children know that they are sort of only there to get a grade at the end, then that's not going to motivate many. I think it motivates some. I think there are some people who are there for the grades and that's what gets them through. But I think, you know, a lot of children need more than that. Um, and I think they yeah they can end up getting turned off school i think the general approach of primary school is has more emphasis on engagement for want of a better word um and an enjoyment perhaps whether that's done intrinsically or extrinsically differs and i think certainly intrinsic enjoyment is the better path to take and I think uh, certainly my own experience was, yes, primary was excellent. I loved it. It was, you know, we had a great time. I can remember loads that I learned, specific things and when I learned them and how I learned them. But I was turned off at secondary. And I know, you know, the piece of work that we're doing in our school, we're deliberately doing that because we recognise that you get all these, yeah, year sevens, super excited to learn in September who by the end of the year who are not as excited and have <laughs> been something has happened whether that's just that they've grown up that little bit or whether it it is because of the secondary experience um I don't know and that's what we're trying to tackle at the moment with the work that we're doing because we do recognize that there should be that enjoyment of learning you know as humans i i think we are you know built to learn yeah. we are designed by nature to thrive off learning and and learning new things can be and should be one of the most exciting things that happens to us in our lives and that i think you can put most enjoyment down to the fact that an experience has been had where something has been learned even if it's not that explicit in terms of a learning experience and that's what that's what we want to provide because that's you know that's where we're going to get the most engagement that's where we should get our best data from even that measurable academic stuff and it's what and it's and it's what should set up the children for a life of of learning and improving and of, of being successful in yeah. whatever they choose to do and, and whatever they define as success right i mean exactly, i think yeah. i think like it's it's really interesting because you, you talk about that example about the year sevens losing interest by the time they get to year eight and actually mm. it what's really interesting is when you go into adult life and you find something you're passionate about you tend to want to learn more about it so it's not a, it's yeah. not that they're getting older and they're getting more mature it's that yeah. they are losing interest right and yeah. that's that's a problem in itself because when i first got into education I mean, like I, I just I wanted to learn everything about it. So I knew what I was talking about and I was exci excited and I was passionate about developing myself. And that's because I found I found my calling. I mean, whereas like these children, sometimes they're getting taught content just because they have to learn it, you know, yeah. and and we're so afraid to like fail. Like, I mean, you have to get 20 out of 20 or you're going to get penalized. I mean, like we, we make our we learn our biggest lessons in life when we make mistakes. And in, in schools, we're not allowed to do that. We're, these children aren't allowed to make mistakes. Otherwise, they get penalized for it. I, I mean, it can affect their careers or their, their livelihoods or close doors for them. You know, yeah. I mean, is that a, is that a system that it needs to kind of be evaluated or reevaluated? Yeah, definitely. Probably? And it and it, but it's a difficult one because I I don't think that would be the case in all schools by any means. But and and there's nowhere sort of systemically that says that that's how it should be or or that that's how it shouldn't be. You know, one of our sort of school mottos i suppose is that mistakes are learning's friends uh mistakes are learning's friend um and we we do encourage that sort of process of evaluating your work 
creating another version of it, taking peer feedback, taking teacher p- feedback and so on. And we're definitely not alone in doing that. We're definitely not uh, unique in the fact that we say okay, mistakes are okay. You just learn from it. I know, for example, as well, my daughters come home talking along those lines as well from their own school. Um, when, whether, it, whether it needs to be built in a bit more to the whole system, you know, that's another thing. Um, certainly one one of the perhaps one of the issues that we do have is that schools are fairly free in many ways to do their own thing yes they need to be offsteaded uh yes they need a curriculum um and safeguarding things need to be in place but in terms of how learning takes place and what learning does take place there's you know there's almost free reign there really and we we there's nothing in place to ensure that approaches like that saying that mistakes are okay and that we learn from them are in place and it's certainly not those sorts of things that I think are the focus of Ofsted for example although I do think that Ofsted's agenda has shifted slightly more towards staff and pupil well-being over the years it used to be the case that well-being of staff was only mentioned in the outstanding criteria so you could be a good school and be absolutely running your staff into the ground in theory um which again in turn is not great for the children is it so yeah i I don't know what the the whole system change would need to be to 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 bring something like that into effect do we do we need to be looking at kind of uh building like having a focus on 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 making children all-rounders and i look what what, what i'm trying to get at is obviously we have such a high account like high accountability and high like such a system of where we look at metrics for how well the students doing academically we judge schools Mm -hmm. on that we judge like them on league tables on that Mm -hmm. but actually bringing like working on the other aspects of your life the emotional intelligence the self-regulation the entrepreneurship leadership like being collaborative all of those things i mean those just because they're difficult to measure is that is that a reason to ignore them like out of the curriculum no (laughs) and i and i'm not sure we could measure them and i don't think we probably should measure them either but i think they should be very very present in the way that schools operate definitely because because there's no point earning like doing really well getting a successful job like earning 100 grand a year for example but being depressed and like an addict the whole time you know i mean like there's there's a level isn't there i mean mental health is going through the roof in the uk i mean Mm. why why aren't we working on emotional intelligence with these kids i mean we spend i think like four or five billion a year at the moment on mental health like trying to resolve it at adult level and child level i mean at like later on in the child child's life I mean, ultimately, we could save tens of billions of pounds later in, like, in our economy by yeah. actually working in primary yeah. schools and secondary schools on emotional intelligence. Why yeah. aren't we realising that? Why do we have such a reactive approach here in the UK? Mm. Well, <laughs> again, that's probably a very political thing, isn't it? Um, and I think, you know, the... <laughs> uh, my perception of the Tory government is that, you know, individual liberty is is at, uh, at the centre. So people are left out, <laughs> and that also the flip side of that is that people. are not as well supported um you know idea of a uh, um and again lots of grass gavin williamson tweeting about mental health awareness for kids one week but then the next week saying extend school hours removal holidays 
Um, you know, kids have just been months of. Surely that's not the right answer. To though. do anything that resembles a normal life, yet the solution put them in school more. I just don't think it, it just doesn't figure for me. And I think we do need to, um, th there does need to be a national effort to, to reprioritize student child 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 well-being um however there's a part of me that kind of would be reticent to try and put that into any sort of curriculum because i think it's such a relational thing it's such a personal thing just like you know telling a school staff that they're doing half an hour of yoga every day for their own well-being is just such a bad idea <laughs> think, you know putting in a national well-being curriculum or anything like that could potentially just be harmful um and i think it's it has to be a, a national collective change in the way that we think um, but I mean, I think, go on. but I mean, if you look at like the big companies like Google, Amazon and all of these like big corporate companies, they work in complete stress free environments. I mean, they've got really cool sofas. They've got gaming rooms. They've got <laughs> all of this stuff. Right. But clearly there's I mean, they spend millions and millions of pounds into well-being and in terms of research into well-being. So why mm. aren't we learning from these companies that have really done the research for us? Yeah, it's a good question. And it. Yeah, you look at you look at some of those environments and think, how how would that work in a school? And I've certainly been to some schools where they've tried to take on some of those principles um, in in how they work and in how they sort of set up the the classroom environment and so on. Um, and and I do I do think we are kind of in a rut with with some things uh, in terms of you know sit down and get on with your work sort of classrooms. I think we could we could afford some more variety there, and that is certainly something we try to do in our school. So we have um, early year style provision areas um, beyond the early years that adapt. Um, it's like, you know, year on year to suit the, the age of the children and to suit the learning that um, needs to take place. You know, we're not, we have an emphasis on the outdoors, for example, uh, learning outdoors. One thing we've just done with some of our catch up money is to employ an outdoor learning mentor who is a learning mentor, but the majority of the work that they do with their mentees will be done outdoors. It's an approach that um, Scotland are really, really looking into and prioritising. Uh, there's a very interesting report about that, um, about the sort of restorative um, environment that, that can be had when learning outdoors. Um, I mean, the theory behind it is obviously the outdoors, it's not restrictive. It, it's like when you go for a walk, you're not stressed out. I mean, you've got that. The, mm. the the fresh air and it's meant to be yeah. actually quite soothing so you yeah. are meant to be in a more relaxed environment to learn yeah. and ultimately yeah. like you we all learn when we're re relaxed right i mean we don't learn when we've got things in our mind or if we've had a bad situation it's yeah. really hard to put that in the back of your mind and continue to yeah. learn right so yeah. i mean the outdoor space i mean yeah it's why the the research probably shows that it's actually like a positive opposed to a negative yeah definitely and you know it's not just it's not just restricted to doing what you would have been doing in the classroom, but outdoors. And it's not just restricted to just doing outdoorsy type things. Um, you know, it's the, the actual act of being outdoors that can make a lot of the difference. Uh, I know certainly for me during this lockdown, the, the thing that really helps the most is being outside, getting to go, you know, just for a walk somewhere, just to see something a bit different, to experience a new place, even if it's just 10 minutes away, um, it it really does make all the difference. And like you say, um, if, if that's, if that, I won't say comfort, but if that feeling is, 
you know, transferred into a learning environment of being at ease and, and ready to learn, then that, like you say, that's that can only be a good thing. Um, and again, you know, it's probably part of our nature, isn't it, to be outdoors rather than cooped up indoors. That's probably more natural to us. Um, so, yeah, the, the outdoors is important. I don't think it's just limited to that. I do think, you know, a wide variety of different learning experiences in, is important. Um, I think as well as having that expert in the classroom role where there might be that direct instruction, I do think teachers can also uh, act in a more, uh, it, you know, they can have more of a facilitator role as children, not, not exactly lead their own learning because that, you know, that has negative connotations of kids just going off and doing what they want. I definitely don't think, you know, that's not what I'm advocating, but I do think that we, we want children to pursue interests that they have. We want children to be independently curious. And I think if we're, we're always dictating what they need to be curious about and in what way they need to be curious, then we risk not developing that. Or well, you risk killing curiosity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, that is the accusation which is levelled against the current education system, which I do think for, for many schools is unfair. However, for, for some, it's probably quite fair that we are not allowing curiosity. We're not allowing that um, natural innate desire to want to learn. And to me, that's just mad because the thing that we most want, all of us want, no matter what your sort of position is, is for children to learn stuff. But if you then have to work doubly as hard to try and make them want to learn it instead of, you know, Don't working with it. the natural desires that they already have yeah. to learn because they're human and because we all have those desires then we're just making it more difficult for ourselves, aren't we? So I think, you know, tapping into children's interests, tapping into children's, you know, like we've been saying, just that natural curiosity to learn. If we can pique their interest, if we can put something in their way that makes them go, hang on, what's this about? I want to know more about this. Then why wouldn't we be doing that? And I do think one thing that we found is, is, that work so well in that in doing that is to relate things back to their own experiences and often to things that they are kind of aware of that are going on around them and that they don't quite understand so you know children are so interested in things like you know current affairs but they often don't really get explained get those things explained to them properly but things even things simply like news round and uh like we get for our kids this magazine called the week junior which just collates all the week's news story into stories into really easy to read thing um articles you know they are so curious about all this stuff they've been you know riding the whole wave of uh, American politics this year and um, all that sort of stuff that it's there they hear us talking about it and they want to know more and so if you can build a curriculum around um, that really? still get teach all those facts and things you want but if you can sit that couch that in things that are relevant to the children things that are really going on in their lives then why not we've just put um Marcus Rashford into our year two curriculum, um, which is all about people who help other people. So it's got your old, you know, Florence Nightingale, Mary Seacole types in it from way back when, but we've also got Marcus Rashford in there because the kids know he's been on news round. He's been on the news. He's been, you know, in these other media outlets that they'll experience online and so on. And it's relevant to them. He's a footballer. So immediately, like at least half the kids, if not more of him, plays for Man U. Um, 
one of the biggest teams in the world. So even if you're not a footballer, you probably know about him. He's just so relevant to the kids. I mean, everything he's been working on is to do with kids, free school meals, reading. Um, so it, it means something to them. Um, we're going to be able to deliver that history curriculum in a, in a much more relevant way. You know, is he a modern day Florence Nightingale? Frame that as a question. And you've got instantly much more sort of curiosity developed. So there's definitely ways of doing it that don't mean that, you know, we're putting knowledge on the, the back burner. Yeah. But at the same time, building on nat- natural curiosity that is there. I mean, I feel like sometimes people just see it as black and white, right? I mean, it doesn't, I'm not mm-hmm. like, sometimes I feel like when I say something, it's like I, what I'm saying is completely disregarding everything that's good that we're currently doing. I mean, that's not mm-hmm. the case, right? I mean, I think there is elements of what we're doing really well, but there is elements that we could do better. And I mean, even looking at yeah. certain primary well, schools in London, they still are teaching about the London Bridge, like being on fire, right? I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, we've had Glenfield Tower fall since then. Why aren't yeah. we using the real world knowledge to actually make it relevant for these kids so they, they can see it they see it on the news they relate to it right and for me you know that's what i'd do that is what i'd do i'd say you know draw draw a timeline from that to now what has changed have things got any better you know how is this similar what what how does the relevance of grenfell help us to understand that historical um event and so on you know there's ways of bringing that in ways of bringing it in and make like you say making it relevant and then you've got an opportunity to really talk about the human side of the the grenfell tragedy that then has that real chance to change who those children are as people to make them help them to be more empathetic to help them to be People who grow up to change things, people who grow up to challenge inequality, injustice. And yeah, I think, you know, we have to be careful not to be overly political, but I'm sorry, that's not a political issue, making sure that people don't die, is it? Yeah. That's, you know, that's something that we should all be aiming for. 100%. Uh, I so. mean, I always, I always find it bonkers that we, we kind of teach what we teach at school. And then at 18, we expect children to go off. And as soon as they turn 18, we expect them to vote. I mean, we've taught them nothing about politics. And then we expect them to know what a manifesto is, how to yeah. um, like email their member of parliament, that their local member of parliament, and know that they'll get a response yeah. back. I mean, I didn't know that till two months ago that I can, I can <laughs> email my um, local MP and he's yeah. going to respond back to me. I mean, like, do you know what I mean? And, we, and then we expect them to vote. Yeah, it, re- it raises the question, doesn't it? Like, what is what is the jurisdiction of school-based education? What should they be learning at school? What should they be learning at home? I do think that, you know, there's this never ending list of things that the Daily Mail suggests school should be teaching. And the, what was the latest one? Oh, the Ofsted report said that kids have forgotten to use the knives and thought <laughs> we're all like, we never taught them that anyway, if they can do that. It's because their parents taught them and so they should have done because you know that starts before home and anyway actually knives and forks is cultural as well so what are you saying about people from cultures who don't use knives and forks as much or that's not such a huge pinnacle of their that culture or whatever it's just yeah we what what we should teach and what we shouldn't teach is is debatable but again i think we're coming back to um what what is going to help children like you say when they when they get to 18 and when they're off in the big wide world what do they need to know for that what's what's really important and i do think you know that recent events have shown that politics is something that children could be a bit more informed on and actually like i've mentioned already something that they do have an interest in um 
and 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 they do have opinions on as well. Um, I think children can sometimes see things a lot more clearly than adults who think they understand how things really are, but actually having that sort of unbiased view that children sometimes do have is is a benefit to them really and it's yeah we we could capitalize on that we could use that we could be um not necessarily politicizing the next generation but enabling them to access like you say the whole system of democracy which we hold up as one of our british values as if no one else has democracy as a value um and and really making making a difference in in that sphere of life which kind of you know politics does impact on everything doesn't it i mean i i'm a latecomer to politics my wife is you know she was she was the one who in school loved politics back then and did a politics degree and all that sort of stuff um yeah i think I mean, I've just stayed away from it my whole life. I mean, like it's just, uh, I always felt like it doesn't matter who I vote for, the country's screwed anyway. But I mean, we won't go into that. I mean, that's, that's a whole different conversation. But Yeah, I think, well, I think that potentially is true, but it doesn't mean <laughs> you're disengaged, does it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, what, what, like, again, it goes back to kind of like asking, what is the purpose of education, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if we're not teaching children how to save up for a mortgage, you know, teaching them how taxes work, what you're voting for, what, um, like, what, like what kind of person do you want to become when you leave school? Like, can you change the world? Like things that are actually like so important, you know, like yeah. especially we've seen over the last year, how much the world has been disrupted by event is completely out of our control. And it, it, it's inevitable. Things like yeah. this will happen again in the future. So yeah. how can we prepare these children to make sure that they are ready for the change? You know? Well, my, my main answer to that would, would not be, well, we need to put all of those things on a curriculum, actually. Yes, some of them might sit well within a curriculum and to, to explicitly teach some of those things, I'm not saying is a bad thing, but it goes back to what we've been saying right the way through is that we need children, teenagers, young adults to be learners because there's always going to be new things that you have to learn. There's always going to be new processes. You know, if you want to understand Brexit and all of the things that have come out of that, then it's it's not a case necessarily of knowing something that already existed. It's Absolutely. about learning about something which is new. So what are the new trade agreements and so on? Sure, having an understanding of what a trade agreement is and what pr- past ones have been are important, but ultimately it's about learning something new. So we have to be developing lifelong learners. We have to be um, helping children to understand the learning process, to, to know what it means to not know something, to understand what the avenues are for finding something out, knowing how to assess that information you know is this true is this not true how can i corroborate that um who do i know that knows something about this who can help me in the first stages of finding out about this what are the other options apart from googling i think is a very important one um where else can i get this information um and and then moving beyond that to synthesize that to be able to use and apply that to be able to you know make sense of that information and it's that process really that should be at the heart of how we work within schools because ultimately that's how we that's how we get through life isn't it you know if, if you if you become self-employed and you have to do a tax return get an accountant that, you know yeah yeah get an accountant because it's impossible but um yeah if that's that's something that you're going to have to learn how to yeah. do isn't it? and um that's a new thing and, and we all 
we all we need to be equipped and ready to be able to learn how to do to do new things ultimately so while some things could be on the curriculum that aren't while some things are on the curriculum that perhaps don't need to be if we are schooling people in how to be learners and if we are not taking away that natural love of learning then i think we're setting them up for almost anything i agree i mean i think look i think it does beg the question though because i've been reading a lot of simon Sinek recently i don't know if you know who he is oh, yeah. but he's uh, so i really didn't start with why and what yeah. one of the most interesting things is actually in the last three months my I've, I've kind of done it naturally in terms of found my why and it's like i've i've gone from being an education recruitment consultant and having my own education recruitment company to like with, with the vision that I want to place teachers into school and make money to now having a vision of like what I'm trying to do is have the children at the heart of and the center of what I'm doing and actually everything is built around that so on Friday I um, renounced my my company as a recruiter and we've, we've turned into an education consultancy and what that means is that we now are able to provide emotional intelligence coaches um, alcohol and drug workshops and like a, a, a motivational speakers or whatever but actually my whole recruitment model has now completely changed because I found my why and actually mm. what's really interesting is that the now I know my why I keep wanting to learn more about how I can keep evolving you know yeah. and I think one of the big problems in until until I was 29 years old right I did not know what my why was I thought it was I want progression I thought I want money I thought I wanted to achieve certain things go on holidays and actually that's not my why I mean that was always a destination but that was just almost like the fuel for the journey but then when I got to director level in my previous company I was like what's next I mean that's all I've ever wanted to do for eight nine years is progress up a company and become a director now what so then I opened my own company and actually I went into a bit of a bad headspace because I actually felt a little bit lost you know I felt like what I was doing wasn't fulfilling and now I mean three months into doing the podcast I feel like I'm a complete different person you know I mean do we have more of a duty to help kids find their why should that not be the center of our curriculum yeah yeah absolutely and that I think, I think that's crucial. And I think that's why, you know, I was talking to my daughter last week. She was saying, oh, she really likes English, you know. She loves writing, she loves reading, but she's not so keen on, oh, I, I think it was Spanish she was saying at that point. Um, and I said to her, yeah, that that's how it is. Sometimes, you know, you like one thing, but you don't like another. You know, for you, your English lessons might be the thing that mean that one day you are an author, you are a writer, you are, you know, an illustrator, a publish, a person with their own published book. That's not going to be the case for someone else in your class, but actually someone else might move to Spain and start a business there and need that language. And I think, you know, by, by providing a breadth of experiences, so whether that's a breadth of um, curriculum subjects or whether that's a breadth of different ways of learning, like we've talked about, whether it's outdoors, indoors, direct instruction, teacher facilitated, you know, discovery based learning or whatever it is, we are helping children to find what, what they are who they are, what their purpose is. Um, and, and, and by allowing children to p- pursue their interests, by celebrating those, by finding ways of, of bringing those into everyday school life, we are, we are doing that already. I think what, what we don't have as an education system is perhaps an understanding of our why. I think... Uh, Very much based around the how and the what, right? I mean, how, yeah, what are definitely. we teaching them and how are we teaching them? But yeah. actually, why and, are we teaching the, never comes up. With, with the sort of broad idea that they're going to need to get a job to earn money to survive, yeah. you know? And and it's, it's fairly utilitarian in that way. Um, but I think, you know, organisations within education you know, do have, you know, I, I know our, our Academy um, Trust has put this work of Simon Sinek and other other thinkers into the very heart of what they do. And, you know, every 
every staff meeting we have starts with our why. So why, why do we exist? That's the question to challenge um, disadvantage in the North, you know, and that's, that's, I won't say drilled into us, negative connotations, but that is very clear. Why are we here? Because there's disadvantage in the place where we teach and, and we're here to, um, to challenge that and to make a difference in the lives of who? Of the children. So we, we are very why based and I think there's plenty of other schools and academies and trusts and things that do the same. But yeah, nationally, I don't know if we've got that. I think we've always had schools, so we've still got schools. We've always had teachers and children in classrooms, so that's what we've still got. Um, and, and perhaps if we, we did redefine our purpose as a system, we might have a bit more unity and a bit more understanding and a bit more of a common direction the, the thing is like obviously with any anything you do i mean if you're in a job for five years you naturally and you became head teacher for example and you were there as a head teacher for three years naturally you, you would work on autopilot you become complacent you know what you're doing and you just get on with it don't you i mean th th that's a problem in itself though isn't it because it's now like you it's worked for a certain period of time and then i mean that's it why 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 fix something that's not broken you know but actually the world is forever evolving so education needs to be evolving with it right yeah, definitely. Definitely. I don't think you can argue with that. I think there's that there are different positions on, you know, how how much things are changing and how much things need to change in education to meet that. Um, but certainly we are the world is changing and we have to keep up. I I personally think there are some things that change in the world too fast. <laughs> and that it's very, very difficult for us as humans to actually change that quickly because our brains cannot work as fast as computers can and so on. But yeah, and that's why before I said maybe we do need to, you know, be taking things back to basics and making sure that we're not overcomplicating things. But yeah, certainly the, the, the education that we provide and the system needs to be relevant and appropriate and fit for purpose. Yeah. I mean, like someone that's gone through school that used to receive EMA. I don't know if you remember what EMA is, but yeah, to do, uh, yeah. Educational <laughs> maintenance allowance. Yeah, yeah. So I used to, I used to, I used to receive that when I was sixteen to eighteen. So I know how it feels to come from a disadvantaged background, to say the least, right? And ultimately, I, for me, what I would have loved is, is for for my school. I mean, I loved my school. I mean, it was it was more of the social aspect though, and there was a couple of great teachers that I respected. But ultimately, I think they could have done more for me in terms of leadership qualities, entrepreneurship. I mean, there were certain things I was good at and there were certain things that I just weren't. And the exams was in some respects, like one of them, I was okay, but I was never like getting the results in my exams that I would have if it was yeah. a verbal, like kind of assessment or yeah. whatever, you know? Um, I, I, mean, think, go on. I think that what that comes down to is relationships, isn't it? Uh, which we mentioned way back at the start. If, if the relationships aren't there and we don't know our kids and we don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are and we don't know what their aims and, you know, aspirations are, then we're going to struggle to provide, you know, what, what that particular child needs. You know, if your teachers had tapped into you a bit more and known a bit more about you, then they could have, you know, given you those experiences. And I think relationships are the foundation of all that we've been talking about you can't provide children with the experiences that that they need if you don't not. know them and don't know what they need yeah. and i think you know that's where primary schools have have the, the sort of natural edge on secondaries in that it's a much smaller environment there are closer relationships because there's fewer children the ratio is, you know, in terms of the, the number of members of staff that each child spends time with, it's just one teacher and one TA or something like that every year. 
but, but that's the it? thing, right? Sorry to interrupt, but that's the thing. That, again, that's the problem in some respects. I mean, we've got 30 children in a class and then we try to teach them such a wide range of content. Right. And it almost dilutes the purpose of education in some respects. I know it's important to teach a, a breadth of, yeah. of like, knowledge, but at the same time, what's the point if you're going to kill the curiosity out of a kid? Yeah. I mean, in, in practice, I don't think any teacher would say, yeah, we've got enough time in the day to teach everything as, in as much detail as we'd want to. Uh, that's kind of the, the eternal struggle. And I think, you know, I've definitely seen people questioning the amount of content that they have in their curriculum, especially during this lockdown when we've been trying to deliver it all remotely and we're realising actually this is this is a lot. This is so much stuff. And um But then do we yeah, have a duty of like finding a child's niche or they're like what they're good at and like by a certain age and then helping encourage them? I mean it shouldn't happen at 16, should it? I mean like we surely by 13, 14, you know the basic numeracy skills that should get you like oh like you should be able to do basic maths and count your change in your pocket. And mm -hmm. like I mean you don't need quadratic equations, you don't need geometry to <laughs> I mean, do you know what I mean? You're I mean you offend some maths teachers. I'm there. sure I will, but ultimately there's only certain few people that are gonna take maths in their careers, you know. I mean, for the rest of the for the rest of us, it's about knowing the basics so we can get on with life, right? And actually, is, is, is there need to be more of a, an emphasis on helping kids find, like, kind of be pushed yeah. in what they're good at? Yeah, definitely. And that particularly, that's something that's been a huge focus in in our primary phase. Um, yeah, what finding what each child is good at and supporting them in that, and that's a very individual approach, and that's in a way that's extracurricular, that child still gets all the, the basic teaching, but also we try to get them on their, their life's journey really with what they want to do. I mean, that, that changes as you go, as you grow, of you course. know, one of the things I've got a daughter in year six and I was chatting to one of our year six teachers today about the year sixes in school and saying that they're at this age where, they perhaps they're ready for some independence, but they don't quite know what they're going to be independent in. And I think one thing that certainly happened to me as a teenager at secondary school is that you, the, the benefit of secondary schools being so, so much bigger is you are exposed to this, this range of people with a range of experiences and you start to explore, you start to find things. So, you know, I spent, um vast quantities of my teenage life up in my bedroom making music driving my dad absolutely insane with the same part looped over and over again whilst I worked on it and I was obsessed I was I I, I wanted to improve I wanted to get better I wanted to do the best I could and I think Sometimes at, you know, year six age, the autonomy to do that sort of thing can often be just outside of your, yeah. your grasp. But it's about working towards and developing, again, developing people who are curious, who want to have those experiences and who want, who know how to go out there and get it, who know how to, you know, not just give up on that, to have that resilience, to know, actually, you know, when I, when I wasn't sitting in my room making music, I was at a skate park, absolutely smashing my body to pieces, trying to get better on my rollerblades. And, you know, it's, it's that desire to improve, to get better at something that you love, that we want to generate. And yes, I think if our sole focus is what facts do they need to know in maths, what facts do they need to know in English, what facts do they need to know in geography, what facts do they need to know in history? <laughs> if that's all we're focused on, yeah. then that is very limiting. Yeah. Although it does provide a good foundation for learning new things and finding more things out. I agree. Um, I mean, there is that element that I'd, I'd always flip it back onto this. I mean, there's still like a lack of political knowledge. There's still a lack of financial, like a knowledge in terms of the real world. I mean, we, we talk about breadth of like 
like knowledge that we're providing them but actually some of the most important stuff is still absent right so i mean i i get what you're saying and i think it's very important but like like you were passionate about your music and you kept trying and kept trying until like you got to that point i mean certain kids go through 18 years of their life never finding anything that they're passionate about and they don't know that feeling of wanting to keep pushing yeah, that's through that sad. that's yeah. sad i mean that's, that's heartbreaking it's those I mean, things that you get get you through isn't it do you know what I mean? And there's millions of children every year that slip through the cracks like that. So yeah. that's why we need to reform education in some respects, because we are letting so many children down. Mm. I mean, obviously, yeah. you, you work in a disadvantaged area and uh, some of these kids are going to have natural obstacles in front of them. I mean, certain children that are from advantaged yeah. backgrounds that get seeds or whatever, they still have connections, probably. Right. Whereas these kids that are from disadvantaged backgrounds that only ever achieve seeds, no matter how hard they work. And actually, we've not found, helped them find anything that they're good in. I mean, that is a massive disservice. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that I, I, you know, I am in total agreement with you. And like I say, our, my, the school where I do work has that um, sort of outlook, that ethos of, of what finding out what everyone is good at and giving them the opportunities they need to be, to get better at that thing, recognising that everyone is, everyone has got a different path ahead of them. Um, and everyone's got, you know, interests and passions and s abilities and skills and flair. And, and that needs to be brought out of everyone. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's about empowering your kids and your staff, right? I mean, if, you, if you're a yeah. senior leader and you, you run a group of like teachers, I mean, ultimately, you don't you don't manage them exactly the same way, do you? I mean, oh, everyone no. works on different motivations Absolutely and, not. you, you yeah. know, and I think one of my big problems growing up was that I was very much uh, motivated by extrinsic motivators. And yeah, actually, yeah, right. it's only in the last three months that I've kind of now it's an intrinsic thing. And actually, like that, that's been the game changer, because for me, like I told you, when I was like got coming up like climbing up the ranks i mean it was always about where do i go next where do i go next and actually yeah. it was never about kind of where i am and that yeah. is i think uh, an element that's missing out of education but i mean we could talk about education all day so i mean i've, I've kept you for quite a long time i <laughs> yeah. mean is there anything that you'd want to add just before we kind of call it i i suppose you know to anyone who's listened to me you know for for however long it's been if you got that far, we've been talking a lot about the system and what needs to change as a whole. You know, we're talking about educational policy here, um, which I think quite often we feel like we have no power to change. I think even if all of that stuff coming from the top down doesn't change you know we are all working like you said with hundreds or thousands of children you know certainly through a, a lifetime of teaching you, you I mean the numbers are vast aren't they? the number of lives of children that you are involved in is that you know we you can change things from a grassroots level you can change things for the children in your class if you're in senior leadership or middle leadership, you can change things for the children in your school. If, you know, you collaborate outside of your own school with other schools in your area, then you can make a difference. If you get yourself on social media and share your ideas, then you can have an even wider impact. Um, yeah, if, if someone invites you on a podcast to waffle on for an hour, then <laughs> you've got a, an opportunity to impact even further. And we, I guess, I guess I, I think there's a real power in changing things from the inside out. Um, you know, that's not to say that I won't be running for prime minister at some point in my life, but or at least education secretary. <laughs> that'd be um, lovely we might make some difference yeah maybe one day <laughs> yeah um i think we have the power to change a lot and even if the education system doesn't have a focus on you know the correct focus on why we're doing what we're doing we can you know and even if your individual school doesn't have that the right focus you can for your class for every child who comes through your class 
you know, you can have that impact on your partner teacher in the other class in the year group or whatever. Um, and, and we can change things and we do have power. And, you know, every time we teach a class of 30 children, that's 30 children going out who, who can also make a difference. And if we've taught them the right things, if we've given them the right skills, that, that desire to learn, that desire to make a difference, then that's powerful, right? That's, that's what education's potential, about. Potential impact is huge, yeah. So I don't, I think we can often feel as teachers, we can feel quite browbeaten. We can feel, um, well, particularly at the moment, we can feel pretty gaslit. And, you know, that that is disempowering. And that is a, an abuse of power from those who are in power. But that doesn't mean that we don't have power. I think we need to sort of reclaim that. We need to... Um, stand our ground remember that we are the professionals we are the trained ones we are the experienced ones we are the ones who can make a real difference and I think we need to be having these conversations we need to be checking ourselves challenging in our ways of thinking is this just um you know am I just thinking this because this is what's always been thought are we doing this because it's always been done um or other ways to do things that are actually going to change things and make a real difference. And yet, like you said about your company, it does all come back to the kids. It always has to come back to the children, even for a company who set out as um, a supply company, you're still sending teachers out every day to work with children. Children are your core purpose and i think we well, need to be. remember that well they should be i mean mm -hmm. there's a lot of recruiters where, and, where it's all about the money right and uh, i'm sure it's majority of them yeah. but i think yeah you're absolutely right the, the the absolute purpose should be the children and and it's yeah. it's the why you do what you do right i mean yeah. it shouldn't be about what you're teaching them and how you're teaching them it's about why you teach them and it's about inspiring these kids and not just getting them yeah. to 18 but actually giving them like the the right love for what they want to do or like the right yeah. passion or the right drive, you know? And I think yeah. that is the human element of education in some respects sometimes is missing. I think there's a lot of schools that are doing it. And I think that, I mean, again, this is no fault of any teacher or school that I'm referring to. I mean, it's, no. it's a systemic no. thing that I'm, I'm talking about, but ultimately no. I think there are a lot of schools and teachers that do really care that trying their best. I think overall yeah. what Absolutely. we, what we're trying our best in maybe shouldn't be as like, the, the the core focus sometimes i think there's, there needs to be another core focus or yeah. what we or, or somebody explained it to me what we're doing right now is filling a nar very narrow cup and actually we can fill a wider cup but maybe just not have to fill it as much you know um yeah, yeah. so and it, it's getting that balance isn't it and making sure that it's not black and white that we're not just doing one thing or the other and that remembering that children uh, yeah they're more than a score they're, they're more than just a number the more than yeah just one of the children in your class as well that they are an individual and that although it's very difficult it's very time consuming it's very um you know energy sapping to do so they need to be treated as an individual and they need what they need which could be different Absolutely. What I mean, the person next to them needs. Absolutely. I mean, as teachers, I mean, you'd be you'd be pretty disappointed if your senior leaders didn't know anything about you, what motivated you, what got you up that, in the morning. Yeah. You know. So why is it any different for children, in my opinion? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, it's been absolutely lovely having you on, Aiden. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, we, we, I, I mean, I've taken up a lot of your time, so I won't take up any more. Everyone, thanks for watching, and Aiden, obviously, thanks for coming on. Yeah. No, thank you very much.